Well, hello, and welcome back to the Lamp Post Listener. My name is Daniel. I'm Phil. And this is a podcast where we journey chapter by chapter through C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. This is chapter 8 of The Horse and His Boy in the House of the Tisrock. The alternative title for this one was The Really Bad Terrible Plan. I don't, I don't, what's that from? It's... It sounds so much like someone Alexander in the, and the very, very terrible, very bad, no good, terrible, bad, no good yeah, day. That thing. Yeah. I was like, well, I did something somewhere. <laughs> uh, I I don't you don't you just dis, you dislike the plan. It's not a great plan. I think it's because they don't know who the Narnians are. They, That's fair. It seems like they win almost every battle. That's fair. From their perspective, it seems like a maybe a decent plan. I don't right. know. I'm really excited to get into this chapter i did i did a, a, a very small bit of research beforehand and i saw some some things online some people didn't like this chapter i thought it was great really yeah oh controversial opinion over here i don't think that's that kind con- it was really fun it was i don't know i mean what, were, ch- what were the complaints too much too much talking too much dialogue I think, I think all the things that i liked about it maybe that's just not everybody's cup of tea i mm. love the political uh, intrigue here. I loved the conversation. I loved the corruptness. I mean, not like I love that, but I found it fascinating yeah. seeing more of the Kalorman culture. I, I got a thing I want to talk about later, especially, you know, they're, they're not just evil for the sake of being evil, which is kind of maybe what I picked up on like way back in chapter one. I was like, oh, okay, this is just, there's supposed to be this clear contrast to Narnia in that they're just very bad and Narnia is very good. And they do some things here that I think might complicate that a little bit. Mm. So I'm excited to talk about that. I found all of that very fascinating. And these three characters, they're fun. They're not good guys at they all. Are. And the timing is excellent. Just There's some the way really... one character will talk, another character will, yeah. character will talk, then he'll get kicked, he'll stay quiet for a little bit, but then he'll come back. And oh, just the balance of everything is very well done. But, uh, but an interesting chapter here in that... We we get nothing from Lazareline or Erevis. They're mm. just behind the couch the entire time. I think there is one line saying that you know the girls could finally breathe again after the leave. Maybe there's like something else in the middle too. But yeah. it's almost completely these three men talking, one scene the entire chapter. So it's a little wow. bottle episode we got today. Yeah. If you were to put this on in a play, would you have them hide out of sight where the audience couldn't see them? Or would they be hiding toward the front of the stage where you could see their reaction to everything? Um, I would probably want them to be off to the side. Maybe you could see them a little bit. Like, so maybe they're like, let's say they're just like stage left or something. And so only some people can see them, but we all know they're there. I wouldn't want them to be like facing the stage behind a couch because I, I would want the focus to be on the the three men talking here and not on... The girls listening because the main focus is is the plan. I wouldn't right. want that to take away from it. Yeah, I but think I've, that's a good choice. But interesting enough, I think this this book has been staged. I think that theater down in uh, South Carolina, which maybe I'll get some info on that when you're reading your uh, uh, your your recap. <laughs> so I, I'll just won't pay <laughs> you'll, attention. You'll kind of half listen. That's great. Um, I think they've done stuff. I think it's like Taylor, South Carolina. Well, I'll look it up in a minute. But they've actually staged this before, so maybe. Oh. Maybe some of our listeners might have been, uh, and they could tell us how they staged this, and if they yeah. did it the right way or not. Yeah. <laughs> but, South Carolina re- uh, listeners, reach yes, out. Yes, our SC listeners, reach out to us. But before we get into the recap for this, cha- not recap, what do we call it? The uh, synopsis. The synopsis, the, the chapter summary. The summary, if you will. That we yes. have here. I, I have a... A well-executed summary. <laughs> I have an addendum. So a couple of chapters ago, I think it was chapter four mm-hmm. of The Horse and His Boy, we we talked about, I said, I made the comment, you you said Tashban, look, look, I'm terrible at this in the storm. Like I said, you said, it's like that episode of Friends where it's like he said that she, he knows that she knows. And, and I knew that he thinks that I thought. Yeah. He yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, you said that, that Tashban, the city, reminded you of Venice. And I completely shot it down and said there is nothing Italian in Narnia at all. Oh, yeah. I went home and cried after that. Well, oh, this is going to feel good. It'll be my turn to cry because um, not only is something Italian in Narnia, it is the actual name Narnia itself. Oh, wow. The, the, the imaginary land of Narnia that we so often talk about here was actually named for Narni, 
which Lewis found in an atlas as a child. It is a small town in Italy, uh, according to Wikipedia, an ancient hill town. Mm. But Lewis, I did read this, uh, Roger Lancelin Green, I think we've mentioned him on the show a couple of times before. He was one of the Inklings. He had written about Narnia and Narnia, and I pulled a little bit of what he, he wrote here. So let me read you what he wrote. Green writes, uh, when Walter Hooper asked Lewis where he found the word Narnia, Lewis showed him Murray's small classical atlas, which he acquired when he was reading the classics with Mr. Kirkpatrick at Great Brookham. Hmm. On plate eight of the atlas is a map of ancient Italy. Lewis had underscored the name of the little town called Narni, simply because he liked the sound of it. Hmm. Narnia, or Narni in Italian, is an Umbria halfway between Rome and Assisi. What's that Umbria? Umbria, I think it's a it's just a province in Italy. I don't know if they use those names, provinces, or just maybe I'll look that one up too when we get there. But uh, uh, more of a provincia. <laughs> okay, but uh, so uh, y'all heard it first here. I was not just wrong, but oh, comically man. wrong. <laughs> that it, we the literal name of the land, the okay. Chronicles of Narnia, is Italian. <laughs> this is like when I thought that Anthony Daniels uh, had a cameo, and I was so sure. This and, is and not then the I same went, thing, huh? This is, I mean, I'm yeah, gonna, and I'm it's gonna, not as catastrophic as here. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm I'm gonna to compliment you for a second and say you being confused at the actor who plays C-3PO, who is completely behind mm-hmm. a mask, and then the actor who played Wedge and Tilly's, who you hadn't seen on screen since 1983, right. When I we're saw the same theaters. guys. <laughs> I, I think that's fair. I think that's fair I that you that. were a little confused about those two. I think not knowing this, we, we are past the stage of being Narnia novices, hopefully, and this was a novice mistake here. I can't wait till we finish season five and we get our certificate because then we'll have completed yeah. five we, out of you, seven. You know what's weird is we didn't get a single email correcting me. That is kind of odd. Isn't that odd? Yeah. Well, here I come. just happened to come across this. Well, okay, here's, here's what happened. You listened to it in preparation for releasing it, and it's only been out for two days. Shush, 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 That's shush. what happened. I bet I, the emails will come before we can do this. <laughs> so let's go ahead and hold I was, the place I right was here trying to make it sound better. In. Yes, we released, no, we released the episode yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> we released chapter four yesterday. <laughs> and I was like, hey, you know, that first 24 hours went by, and uh, no emails yet. So That's right. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be here by now. All right. Well, I just I thought that I needed to uh, kind of just make sure that people knew that I was wrong. And with that, I think it's time to go in and talk about chapter eight. So, Phil, it's an even ta- chapter. Take it away. <laughs> Dana just cocked open a beer. And I got a little bit on my screen. Though. Did you see that shoot? Oh, my maybe, brand new maybe MacBook you do Pro need a that screen I have. Protector. Yeah, I just asked you if I should get a screen protector. Yeah, if anyone's wondering, we um, we may sound a little different because Daniel is using an upgraded computer and I'm using an upgraded electronic book. Neither of which play any role in recording. <laughs> Nothing is plugged into my MacBook Pro. Nothing is plugged into your Kindle. That's right. So if you do hear a change in audio, it is because you, the listener, are maybe you got new headphones or something. I don't know. But there should be no difference. Than no usually difference. Is. But uh, let's do a quick pints for Jack and you explain what you're drinking and I'll explain what I'm drinking. Well, I am drinking the uh, Saving Daylight here. It's from the Virginia Beer Company. Is that a summer ale? Uh, it's something that my wife picked out. I'm, I'm more of an IPA guy mm-hmm. in the summer, but she had got, it's a, um, it's just a wheat ale. It's, it's not bad for a wheat ale. I like it. Not usually my thing, but I saw the IPA, a couple of IPAs in there from Ardent. Um, and I was like, you know what, let's go with this one from Williamsburg. Anna and I are traveling down to Williamsburg tomorrow. And so I thought that'd be a fun, uh, way to get excited for a little, uh, little trip out of town. Yeah. Drink a beer right before a road trip. <laughs> We're leaving tomorrow. You just spilled it all over. I just spilled it. I just spilled it on the book of common prayer. Yeah. So oh. the TLDR is that Daniel is drinking a beer, and I had a lime flavored polar seltzer. Yeah. You're not. You're not a big beer guy. Not your uh, thing. I love the. I love the first sip or two. Yeah. And it's just not worth paying for the whole thing. Phil is awkwardly okay. Again, you would have to. I already paid for the beers in my fridge. <laughs> But Phil... You would be so mad if I took two sips and then threw the rest of it away. You have totally done that before. Yeah, I pour it in a glass and then I hand you the rest of the beer. So now you have one and seven Whenever we have a get-together with friends and stuff, Phil goes around and asks everybody, can I have 
a sip of your beer. Yeah. This was before COVID, obviously. Right. Uh, but he'd we go around, touch everybody's beer, would drink all everybody's, get once. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you do, I have seen, I had seen you, you, red wine every once in a while. I see with a glass of red wine. Yeah, sure. It, it, it is really nice with Italian food. That is true. Yeah, or, or a slightly fancier pizza place. What what is slightly fancy? Let's rank. Okay, look. I know this is a little off topic. I, I do, do think this. this will actually make sense when you see the listener email that we have later. Go ahead. Give us an example of cheap pizza, uh, slightly fancier, and then fancy pizza. Don't have to be all encompassing. <laughs> Little Caesars, us- Domino's, Papa John's. No, get out of <laughs> here. Just, those are all on the bottom tier. Things. Okay, not even. The, it's okay if you like those, but like they're all cheap pizza places. I feel like they're the places where they open a can. To put vegetables on your pizza, and then they're the places that will actually chop the vegetables fresh okay. and put those on your pizza. So you are refusing to go on record in naming pizza joints. I can do that. Um, have you been to uh, Pupatellas? I love that place. Yeah. Oh my gosh, so good. To me, I feel like that is kind of in between the last two you said. Like it's, it's not super super fancy. Yeah, it doesn't have like a very specific goat cheese, but it is really nice. It is nice. I do like um, it a lot, but. You know, I'm glad that there are different types of places for the different types of people. I am, I, look, you're going to be 30 in like a month. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be 30 in like a month and a week. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if this is embarrassing or not. Maybe if I, I hope I never go back and listen to these when I'm like 50, but maybe 50 year old me will be embarrassed by this. But I am about to be a 30 year old man. Man, as my wife walks in, she's not going to be happy with this. And pizza is still <laughs> my favorite food. Is that like... I feel like it's supposed to have changed by 30, but I have only doubled down. The older I get, I'm like, no, it's definitely pizza. Yeah. It's the best food in the world. I think that it shows maturity that you can still say that pizza is your favorite food. What's your favorite food? Again, mm. I promise this makes sense when we get to our listener feedback later. Okay. Right now, it's a pad to you. See, I knew you were going to go with like Thai food or something to make me look like a scrub who just likes pizza. I also really, drunken noodles is my favorite mm. whenever, um, not, not always, but I often get that when we go out for Thai or something. Uh, I do like Pad Siu though too. It's, it's, it's good. Sure. But see, that makes me look like I am just like very immature in my taste. And I'm like, I like, I like a pizza, you yeah. know? All right. Well, I think it is time to finally get to the chapter summary. Phil, chapter eight, the house of the Tizrock, take it away. Prince Rabadash furiously complains to his father about the Narnian's escape and states his wish to pursue Queen Susan and make her his wife by force. However, the Tizrock does not desire open war with Narnia and initially does not seem likely to change his mind on the matter. Rabadash is able to convince him with the following plan. He will surprise Archerland with an attack, then swiftly ride the rest of the way to nearby Kara Paravel and catch Susan just as she arrives home. And if anything were to go wrong, then the Tizrak can simply deny he knew anything about it. Upon consulting with the vizier, the Tizrak agrees, and after the prince walks out, Erevis and Lazaruline hear the king say that he wouldn't mind if Rabadash were to perish. All right, so I know I said I was going to look something up while you were talking, but I spent the entire time trying to remember what I said I was going to look up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember what, what was it was? That? I have no idea. Oh, man, I'm glad we recorded it. It's too bad because we can't see. All of our listeners can just go back, you know, 60, 90, however long it's been. Yeah. Uh, seconds. Uh, I, we can't, so I don't know what it was. Something about Italy. So it was something. Oh, if they use pro- oh what Umbra? No, what was Umbr- it? Umbridge. Umbra. Who is Professor Umbridge? Who is Professor Umbridge? Umbra is actually a planet in Star Wars. Umbria is an Italian region. It's a region most famous for its roast suckling pig. A region famous for that sounds good. It I really does. That. All right. Well, let me tell you this, Phil. You did a great job here with a chapter where there's a lot of information. But I need to ask you this because it, so much of this worked for me. A lot of it really did. I thought this is one of the highlights of the book so far was this chapter. But I need you to, to tell me, why does Rabbit Dash care about Susan so much? Hmm. I think he's a fool. And I think that his pride has been hurt. Yeah. And in the set of circumstances that he has around him, he doesn't have any way to deal with that. Most likely because it hasn't happened before. Yes. He's always gotten his way all the time. 
That's a perfect and then he answer. Runs into this. this is great because I was sitting here frustrated about the whole time. But you're right. He's a little man boy, right? Yeah. He's he he doesn't get his way, and so he's throwing a temper tantrum. He he makes it clear he's really not even interested in Susan, like. He he says some pretty awful stuff, and that was just the stuff they were able to print. There were yeah, other things there was way worse stuff there. He doesn't even like her. He just needs to have her because someone told him he couldn't. Yeah, right. And it it hurts his pride. He's very arrogant. I of all the people in this entire thing, I thought Rabidash came across as the worst. And this that's that's saying something because he's not standing next to two nice guys either. Mm-hmm. But he came across as a huge jerk here, and just a a whiny little child. Yeah. You know, and I loved it. I loved. Yeah. I love a villain like this. I thought it was so fun. I did, but that's helpful because that was the one thing I struggled with. It was like, what are maybe his motives? Because I thought there could be a couple different things. Yeah. What did you think of the chapter? This was. I loved all of the dialogue. I really love some good dialogue that tells a little bit more about the characters and the story at the same time. Like you can tell by the way they're communicating about something, where they stand in relation to each other, and then also what their inner motives are, and then. By the end of the chapter, you have way more information than you started with. Yeah. And it's all through dialogue. It's not describing the history of this character, what happened before. It's all packed in what they're saying. Sorry, I'm <laughs> trying not to laugh. I think it was with me. Anna was sitting there. She's, she's cooking dinner as we're recording because she's been at the gym. And she waited till it went to 0.01 on the on the microwave oh, and pulled it like right at the last minute. But then she yanked it so loudly that I think it did the exact <laughs> same made the exact same amount of noise as the little beep 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 that the microwave would have made. It's like when you're trying to sneak up the stairs and you actually draw it out. It's like Dude, Arr. we have we have the Arr. worst stair. Our our the penultimate stair mm. before you get to our second floor is so the house is it was built in 1920. It's over 100 years old. Wait, wait. the penultimate would be second from the top. Yeah, that's what I said. So it's right before the top. <laughs> so it's is it if you go down one step, is it that one or is yes. it two? No, 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 no. That's the last step. No, the, the then it's the floor. <laughs> no, 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 no. The first, the last step is the second floor. That's still a step. No, it's that's the floor. I I count that as you you are now a, on a different level. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll find. Now, if you're walking down the stairs, completely different story. This, that would be the first this step. step before you get to the second floor is very, very creaky and it okay. is just absolutely miserable. Oh yeah. I have to like jump over it pretty much. If 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 the kid's asleep, I can't I gotta jump over it. Yeah. I like army crawl pretty much yeah. up there. I've never really had that problem because my knees pop. It was also fun in this chapter to get to hear more from the Tizrock himself. Yeah. The character he- shrouded in mystery up until chapter eight. Up, yeah, up until right now. So why don't we go ahead and walk through this chapter? We broke You and I broke this up into three little parts here, um, even though it's just one conversation. We're going to talk first about the problem, mm-hmm. then the plan, and then you very wisely kind of rounded out this alliteration with the post-amble. The post-amble, yes. So what is the problem that Rabidash comes in with? Let's start the chapter off. He, he wants Queen Susan, but she got away. Yeah, so we actually missed... This uh, the entire escape, right. which I really like. I, I, I mentioned, love it too. I mentioned a couple of chapters back that my big fear in introducing Edmund and Suit, introducing but bringing them back uh, in chapter four was that I was I was slightly concerned they were going to take the story away and it was mm-hmm. going to lose Shasta and Erebus as well. Hasn't done that. In fact, their big escape we we really we hear out the plan and then they're gone. I really liked that. I it was, that was, it's just like you were talking about earlier. Sometimes you can choose to hide some characters mm-hmm. to allow the focus to be on something else. And they and did. so by not showing those events, we still had the full effect of it happened. We just heard about it. Yeah, and it, it reminds us that, that Lewis is reminding us that this is not the Pevensey story. Mm-hmm. That this is Shasta's story. And Erebus, too. I mean, it Shasta still does seem like our protagonist. Again, we're halfway through the book at this point. I'm not really sure. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that they reunite in the next chapter or two. But at this point, our characters have been apart since chapter four. Mm-hmm. It's hard. You know, half of the book has been Erevis and Shasta separated. And in fact, we have not heard from Bree or Huynh since early chapter four. Half of the book, they haven't been there, which I'm surprised because I thought that Shasta and Bree were going to be the main characters of the whole book. And I, I right. don't. 
I don't even know who Bree is anymore. I don't even know where he is. I hope yeah. he's okay. Yeah, probably still a horse. I would assume so. Yeah, we're hoping so. Yeah. I'm now just from a storytelling point of view, I'm now realizing how many stories split a group of characters up. So that and I'm wondering if the author does it to focus on the characters or maybe people just have maybe you can get more adventures in per per novel this way. But and it's I'm getting some real Lord of the Rings vibes from this too. Just you have mm-hmm. this group and then it gets split up and they're not they're not together for most of the story. Sure, yeah. And you can even hear it in the score for the Lord of the Rings where the the scores never heard all together until they're reunited. Yeah, yeah, that's that's well said. Have you read past this chapter or no? I have. Yes, I am. I am completely done with the book. You and have I, finished I've it. I've been waiting to reveal this live on the air. Okay. In this pre-recorded so you, show. <laughs> I know everything that happens in the book. You have finished the book. All right. So you know who dies at the end, I assume. Who dies? Tell me. I can't tell you that. I'll see if maybe yep. you even got a reaction. Like, no, no one dies. I'd be like, great. Now I know. <laughs> what I realized is I could have pretended this whole time that I'd read the whole thing and it would have zero consequences. <laughs> it would have. That's true. <laughs> because you have no way to verify it. I don't. Um, Unless you were also lying. No, no, no. And you I had read truly, the whole thing. I, you're pretending and your guesses get slightly better each time. I know that the next chapter is called Across the Desert and I know nothing else about it. Cool. Um, that's good. So, yeah, let's get back to this conversation. So, Rabidash comes in and, you, like you said, he is mighty frustrated because Susan has escaped... Um, and he's blaming his father in a very pretending to be subtle, but not subtle way. Yeah. You know, if you had let me have a fast ship, I could have caught up with her, but she got away. And, and again, you just see this guy's arrogance. Like it's nothing is ever his fault. It is always the fault of someone else, which is the sign of a very arrogant and just bad leader, right? Mm-hmm. It's never my fault. Nothing, everything that goes right is on me. I did yeah. that. Everything that doesn't go right is definitely someone else. Right. Right. A, a it's terrible. It truly is that a good leader will take the, take the blame and take responsibility, more like take the responsibility. Mm-hmm. And then whenever something goes right, we'll spread the, yeah, spread it's, the it's success. It's the inverse around. of what a healthy leader yeah. looks like. Right. Absolutely. So he comes in with the vizier who, I believe, tell me if I'm wrong, the vizier is is um, Erevis's ex fiance, correct? Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, wow. That really helps. There's, there's some soap opera stuff happening here. Yeah. Interesting. That's, remember, that's why she's more than happy to see Rabidash give this guy a couple of kicks in the behind. Yeah. Because she doesn't mind too much. She's like, okay. yeah, get that guy. This, I don't yeah. like him either. Man. So see, that's that's one problem with reading these a chapter at a time spread out a little bit. Mm-hmm. I love that you reconnected that for me. Yeah. So she she enjoys the fact that he's getting kicked around a little bit. Yeah. And so satisfactory who wouldn't again this is a 60 year old man that was trying to marry a we don't know exact age i'm assuming 12 13 year old girl you know yeah i think we're i think we're more than happy to see this uh this guy be treated this way yeah so let's let's keep going into this conversation because the tisrock asks rabidash his son the prince to to compose himself right and he does it in this amazing way. And I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because I I highlighted this part. And I'm hoping that my highlights on my electronic book will contribute to the mass total of highlighted parts. And one day you sure. may see what I highlighted. Mm-hmm. But he says, For as a costly jewel retains its value, even if hidden in a dunghill, so old age and discretion are to be respected, even in the vile persons of our subjects. Desist, therefore, and tell us what you desire and propose. What a crazy combination of speaking down to his son, a weird analogy to a dunghill, and also insulting the person that you're in a way kind of protecting from more physical violence. Yes, this all packed into four lines. I also highlighted this little paragraph here. Oh, right, two as people have highlighted talks, this as, as the Tizrock talks to Rabidash because. There is some really, there's so many interesting things happening here, right? So the context is Rabidash has been kicking the vizier. Um, He calls him a dog. He's really frustrated with him because he's, you know, the vizier kind of talks down to Rabidash. He's definitely the young guy, right? Uh, Rabidash is. He's like, look, you know, he gives him this little like maxim too. He's like deep drafts from the fountain of reason are desirable mm. in order to extinguish the fire of youthful love. He's pretty much calling him a child, right? 
telling him to grow up, which he does need to do. Uh, but obviously, Rapidash doesn't like this. Begins kicking him, and like you said, then the Tizarok gives him this other maxim, which I, we I really want to talk about this. Let me read it one more time. You said it great. I really want to read it, it slowly and then unpack what's happening here. So he says, "As a costly jewel retains its value." Even if hidden in a dunghill, so old age and discretion are to be respected even in the vile persons of our subjects. This isn't just simply an evil leader being an evil leader. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned earlier in the episode, when I first in, you know encountered the Kalormans, I assumed they were going to be this kind of just bad guys for the sake of being bad guys kind of thing to contrast with the Narnians. But they're not simply as black and white as that. Let me say why. Because they don't just hate all that is good. In fact, they seem, or at least the Tisrock, the leader of the Kalorman, seems to value wisdom. Misplaced wisdom, but still wisdom nonetheless. When he's saying something like, hey, a costly jewel, even in a dung hill, retains its value, that actually is something that I think isn't a bad thing to think about. To say, hey, like, everything has value no matter where it is. Maybe that's how he's saying it. He might not be, and he's not going to interpret it that way. But if I were to say that, you know, every person, no matter where they live or where they come from, has value. Mm -hmm. Right has infinite value because they're made in the image of God, right? Of course, we'd agree with that as Christians, absolutely, right? So then, as he goes on, he says, "Old age and discretion are to be respected, even in the vile persons of our subjects." And this is where he twists the wisdom, yeah. right? So he's he's saying that age and discretion are this jewel. It's a good thing. He's saying, "Hey, we should value people." especially value the wisdom of people who are older than us. We should respect them. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. That's right. not a bad thing. Then the and then he gives turn. the other little thing. He says, even if they're in our subjects. Right. So he, he finds a way to give value and respect to the vizier while also completely dehumanizing him yeah. at the same time. And that's where, yes, of course that's evil. Of course that's wrong. But... It's not as simple as a bad guy that's just bad because he loves being bad, yeah. right? This is he, he seems to believe that he is being wise and even, in a very sick and twisted way, charitable yeah. towards the vizier. What he is saying is kind in his very sick mind. And that's really interesting to me because I don't think we've encountered any kind of villains in the Chronicles of Narnia that have been anything but just, hey, I'm bad, and that's kind of my thing. Yeah. Right? The White Witch, just bad. 100% evil. Miraz, yeah. bad. Right? Don Treader, no villains. Uh, Gumpus, I mean, but he, the, it's not the, the same mess, kind of thing. bad. Yeah. Uh, green. But yeah, you know, and then you get the silver chair, and you got the Lady of the Green Kirtle, obviously bad. Dufflepuds, bad. Mm -hmm. uh, they just hate everything good, mm -hmm. and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, You're running out of bad guys, but sure. Yeah, sure. But it's so interesting to see the Tizrock have this very perverted sense of wisdom. And I am so intrigued with what Lewis is going to keep doing with this character if he comes back. I'm hoping that this is not the last we see of him because I love... If, if you're reading this as a child or as an adult, we can see someone that kind of uses the language of the good-natured or of the kind leader, but twisted enough to really just fit their own desires, right? Mm -hmm. So we see it. It's a little bit more complicated than anything Lewis has done before with his villains. Yeah, and it's a, a nice evolution or just a way to mix it up. Who knows what the next one will look like? And you, you actually might know. So then this conversation continues... Um, and Rabadash, so we, we've, we've covered the problem. The problem is Susan has escaped, and Rabadash doesn't like that. Mm -hmm. And so then there's the plan. And we go through a couple of different plans first, and I really want to talk about this, a little bit of the conversation that happens here. Rabadash is like, hey, we should just, let's just go ahead and go to war with Narnia. Let's get them, right? They're a lot smaller than we are. 
we can take them out. And Phil, how does the Tizrock respond to this? Well, for, in order to understand the Tizrock's response, you have to hear a little bit about the proposal. And the proposal is he wants to get all of the armies out and completely kill everybody in Narnia except for Susan. And then he'll be able to marry her. So, you know, as I say all this stuff about the, the Kalorman villains, maybe Rabbit Ash does still fit into that. This guy's just evil. Like, he's yeah. just a horrible person. And again, I'm not saying that Tizarak is a good person, but there's not even any kind of like complicated aspect to him other than like, no, he's just a whiny baby who wants to kill a ton of people. Right. Or maybe he's using a popular negotiation tactic and asking for way more so that he can... Oh, you seen that episode of The Office? Scale it back down, yeah. As long as he's not wearing a uh, woman's suit, right? That's Is that right. what Michael does wrong, right? <laughs> it's mystique. <laughs> <laughs> or, mi- or mystery? I don't remember. It's, it's Italian, is, is what he said. <laughs> and the mystery is why the pockets are <laughs> in the wrong place. <laughs> the funny thing about that is that him... And Daryl then drive to New York, right? Because he's going to mm-hmm. ask for his his raise. And for some reason, they don't stop by Michael's condo in Scranton to let him change clothes. <laughs> I know that the episode isn't as funny if they do that. But, like, it, they could easily have stopped there and let him change. But, no, yeah. like, Daryl's, like, get in the car. We're go- <laughs> going yeah. to New York. Got to use that momentum. It's a great episode. Uh, everybody, if you haven't seen it, it's episode, I want to say, 18 of season three, Ooh. The Negotiation. I want to fact check it because Daniel gets away with this way too often. Season three, episode 18. Look it up right here. Live on the show. Is it criminal minds? No. Is it cocktails or is it the negotiation? It's the negotiation. Was I wrong? Cause cocktails is the 18th episode. What is, what is the negotiation? Wait. Oh, was this a double? Yeah. Uh, then, yes, it is also 18. So they put two titles in it? That doesn't make any sense. It's, well, you um, were right. It's you the, the negotiation. The office did some... Embassies did some weird stuff um, with the office in season three where there were a couple of not even like double episodes, but 40... Not f- like actual like aired over the course of 40 minutes. So 28-minute yeah. episodes. And I believe that the negotiation was one of those. I know branch closing was another one that was like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very odd. So I think the actual like production code of the negotiation is actually like 319. So I, I think I'm actually off by one. Hmm. Well, it's an understandable. We'll give you a... But hey, I'm we'll off by one. point for that. Yeah. So then um, Rabidash responds with a slightly different plan. Well, wait, before you go on, let's can we talk about how this interaction between the two of them as Rabidash and the Tizarak disagree and kind of the little jabs they give to one another. Oh yeah. Uh, this is, can you read, so, why don't you read this? Yeah, so, so sneaky. And I also highlighted this. If you were not my father, Oh, ever living Tizrak said the prince grinding his teeth. I should say that was the word of a coward. And then the Tizrak replies. And if you were not my son, Oh, most inflammable Rabidash replied his father, your life would be short and your death slow when you had said it. The cool, placid voice in which he spoke these words made Erevis's blood run cold. Ugh. This is... Uh, so much tension. So much tension and just such a lack of kindness towards one another. It's, it's funny because you know, we just talked about respect in, in what the Tizrak said earlier... And yet, obviously, Rabidash is not respectful here, just calling his dad a coward, mm-hmm. right, without hearing him out at all. But then uh, Tizrak gives him no respect by saying, hey, if you weren't my son, I'd uh, torture you to death, yeah. right? And, th- and that's what I think is interesting about the Clormans is the fact that the Tizrak talks in these kind of like platitudes about, you know, honoring things and wisdom, but like it, it seems to be completely hollow. But what's interesting is it doesn't seem like the Tizrak realizes the hollowness of his own words, which is why I find him so intriguing because he, like, Rabbit, I, I wonder, maybe I'm wrong, like, Rabbitish has to know he's kind of a jerk, right? Maybe not, but I, I get the sense that he's just like, he doesn't care one way or the other. Yeah. Whereas, like, the Tisrock wants to be able to put his head on his pillow every night and be like, I'm a good guy. Mm-hmm. Whereas Rabbitish doesn't care. He's like, I, I don't care if I go to sleep. Uh, I Very sleep brush. well no matter what. 
What did I, did I call him something else? No, no, I was just adding to what you said. Oh, okay, good. Fresh. I was like, did I call him like, I'm keep afraid that I'm going to call him radish. And <laughs> so I'm trying not to do that. But then just getting back to that little uh, exchange between the two, Rabidash goes on to say, but why, oh father, why should we think twice about punishing Narnia any more than, I mean, th- listen to this, any more than about hanging an idle slave or sending a worn out horse to be made into dog's meat. Oof. I'm going to have to put like the, the PG 13 rating now on this, but just, uh, on this, episode, just by how I was, I was worried about dunk Hill. You thought maybe that was get us there. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> but I mean like it's okay. It's not even, okay. I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, defend any of what they're saying, but it's not even like, a rebellious slave or a misbehaving slave, just an idle one, Mm -hmm. right? Just an idle one. And then taking a worn out horse to just be fed to the dogs. I mean, these are two disgusting things that are just so normalized by rabbit ash here. I'm fascinated by their educational system. Just the fact that they were able to pull these out in the middle of a tense conversation. Well, and that's, see, that's the other thing that intrigues me and we'll get, maybe I'll, I'll bring this up right now I guess is throughout this chapter all three of these men have an incredible vocabulary Mm -hmm. there are multiple words that I'm (laughs) I was reading this and maybe when we get to them later on I'll mention them and I'm just like oh man if a fourth or fifth grader is reading this they have no idea what that word means and even context makes it difficult in some of them right Right, and that's and Lewis isn't throwing them in there to show off how smart he is. So if he's using these words, he is clearly trying to communicate something to us as readers. And it's not just, hey, I got a great vocabulary. Mm-hmm. It's that no, these characters have great vocabularies. These are educated men. Yeah. Right. These are smart, smart, and and maybe we could be wrong. They might be way more educated than the Narnians are technically. Right. right. And yet, and yet we see all of the wrong that's being done. And this is coming from someone who's an educator. I'm not saying education leads all to those bad things at all, but it's, it's, I, I wonder if Lewis is someone saying, Hey, look, education just for the sake of education, just go showing up and going to school doesn't solve all of our problems, which right. sometimes we do fall into that trap where we just go, Hey, as long as you get that degree, you're good. And it's like, no, it's gotta be something more than just show up to school for 12 years and you're good. You know, right. There's more than just book knowledge. Absolutely. Yeah. So why is it that the Tisrock is afraid of going to war with Narnia? I think it could lead to a, a long conflict or just it's not like guaranteed victory. Like it probably he probably is a little bit terrified. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 weird to hear a little bit about the line the witch in the wardrobe here is like, look, they used to have this queen. Mm-hmm. She's pretty powerful. And she's gone. She's not here anymore. Yeah. And that so what's worries, that all about? Yeah, he's like, that worries me. I'm not super interested in going to war with something that I can't quite explain. And then he gets into the really interesting. I want to read what he says here. Here, here is what the Tizrak says. It is commonly reported that the high king of Narnia, whom may the gods utterly reject, is supported by a demon of hideous aspect an irresistible malfeasance who appears in the shape of a lion. Therefore, the attacking of Narnia is a dark and doubtful enterprise, and I am determined not to put my hand out farther than I can draw it back. Mm. You know, I thought of here, as I was reading this, I thought about the second chapter in the book of James, uh, verse 19, something that always stuck with me when I first, first read the screw tape letters many years ago which is um, that, that verse from James says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe, and they shudder, right? Mm-hmm. I love that whole, like, great, you believe that God exists? Like, good for you. Demons believe God exists. That's not saying too yeah. much, right? And it's, it's looking at, at the Kalormans here and saying, look, the Kalormans believe in the existence of Aslan, right? Even, even the Tisrak here, who seems to be kind of being set up as, like, the, the main enemy of Narnia at this time fully believes in Aslan. And I can think of multiple characters in Narnia who were on the good side that really struggled to believe. Mm -hmm. And I I thought about that line. It's like, look, the demons, people who are straight enemies of God believe that God exists. So just saying, I believe in God, that's that's not cutting it. Just believing that he exists. So I thought that was really an interesting thing here. Hmm. 
But it's also interesting to, to hear what their thoughts are on Aslan mm-hmm. and just the different beliefs there. So then we get the whole plan. Do you actually want to go ahead and read all of um, Rabidash's plan here? It's a little paragraph there. Here then, O Father, this very night and in this hour, I will take but 200 horse and ride across the desert. And it shall seem to all men that you know nothing of my going. On the second morning, I shall be at the gates of King Loon's castle of Anvard in Archenland. They are at peace with us and unprepared, and I shall take Anvard before they have bestirred themselves. Then I will ride through the pass above Anvard and down through Narnia to Kara Paravel. The High King will not be there. When I left them, he was already preparing a raid against the giants on his northern border. I shall find Kara Paravel, most likely with open gates, and ride in. I shall exercise prudence and courtesy and spill as little Narnian blood as I can. And what then remains but to sit there until Splendor Hyaline puts in, with Queen Susan on board, catch my strayed bird as she sets foot ashore, swing her into the saddle, and then ride, ride, ride back to Anvard. And that's the plan. How do you feel about this plan? Give it a rating one to five. Uh, one being the lowest? Yes. It's Why two. would one be the highest? <laughs> I don't know. A, you play golf? It's, uh, this isn't golf. You say you give it a two? A two. I'm going to uh, I'm gonna give it a 2.5. I'm going to give oh, it a 2.5 okay. here. Yeah, I'll Engine go a little higher. Only, than, please. I'll go a little bit higher than you, but I agree. Uh, not a great plan, mostly because uh, I know the Narnians, and this isn't a great plan. But I'm going to go, I'm giving it a 2.5 out of 5 because the interesting part of it is that he kind of covers his tracks in a way as he goes on later to tell us and that he's like, look, if this doesn't go well, okay, you can say you didn't know anything about it, right? Dad, don't pretend like you just didn't know. Mm-hmm. And he's like, wait, how does this help me? You know, Tizarek says, how does this help me conquer Narnia? He's like, look, yeah, I'm going to get to Narnia, but I'm going to have permanently conquered and Vard right. and Archenland. Like, that's ours. That's not like a boom, I'm coming in. He says, like, I go in like the, like a, a bow and arrow or something. He's some kind of metaphor like that to get Susan and come back. But the, but, you know, we'll have Anvard, and you can kind of slowly fill your troops in there, right? And then you can attack secretly. Like, you can, right. you can kind of slowly, secretly build an army to really go in and hit Narnia. Yeah. The reason why it's a two-point, because that, that's not a terrible plan. Again, I don't want it to happen because I, I really dislike these Kalorman characters mm-hmm. uh, and really like our Narnian characters. But the reason it's then bad is because some of the other stuff, he just like kind of gives these really terrible answers to be like, oh, don't worry about that. Okay, he, this is one of the ones. Uh, what are you going to do about Prince Edmund? He's like, well, I'm not going to kill him. I'm just going to have 10 guys just stop him. Like, what What does that mean, yeah. Rabidash? What do you mean? You're going to have 10 guys... They're all gonna just go hold him, and Edmund's yeah. not gonna kill them. Like, come on, what do you? That just seems so immature. It also part. seems like one of those details where, what if that part doesn't work? Does yeah. your whole plan fall apart? And it, we'll see what happens. But. Well, then the other big part of his plan that's terrible is he is convinced that that King Peter, High King of Narnia, will be totally fine with this. Do you, what is the explanation he gives here? I think that he's nice. Or, he, yeah, I mean, yeah he's, and he's not there. But when he comes back, he'll he'll just he'll want them to be married. Yeah, that's a terrible, <laughs> terrible plan. He's like, yeah, he Clearly seems like a true. he seems like a nice guy. Which one we know Rabadash doesn't believe because he hates all the Narnians. He mm-hmm. consistently calls them barbarians and talks about how much he hates them. That's just something you say. <laughs> he's like, guy's nice, and then on top of that, he's like, you know what? He'll want us to be married. Because he wants, you know, it, it'll be, we're much more powerful and he'll want to align himself with us. He even then lets it slip, which is really not a good point on his part. He's like, look, he'll want, because I'm going to be Tizrock one day. And won't he want that? Because I'll be married to his sister. It means his nephew or niece will be the heir to the throne, right? And this is really unwise because from what we understand in this chapter, the Tizrock is supposed to live forever. Mm-hmm. So when you slip it that, hey, you're waiting for daddy to kind of uh, croak over here, <laughs> yeah. it's maybe giving away too much of your plan to the guy who runs the whole country. Right. And, and, and the Tizarek absolutely 
picked up on that. He said, he will not see that if I live forever, as is no doubt your wish, and then which he d- says in a drier voice than usual. It's the way he describes the voice <laughs> as even drier that makes this is, it stand out so much. I am oh. loving what Lewis is doing here. I think he, it's, it seems like Lewis is having a lot of fun. And I'll also say this too about this chapter. We haven't talked about it all yet, but I think some of the more uh, difficult and what we might call problematic elements of the depiction of the Cormans don't really show up in this chapter mm-hmm. at all. There are some illustrations by Baines that I think are are not great. They really yeah. aren't. And I in think in terms they, of what they're depicting, I think they really easily fall into stereotypes yeah. that are not helpful at all. Um, but I think in this actual chapter, we see that the Cormans don't necessarily need those you know, stereotypical elements to function well. And so I think it almost just frustrates me just a little bit more to be like, oh man, like we didn't need to have these kind of caricatures for these characters to work. They work really well. They're great characters and the culture really works outside of some of those Middle Eastern stereotypes or caricatures that unfortunately have been a part of the book so far, but they're not really here in this chapter. Yeah. That's been nice. It would, you want your characters to be able to stand alone and where it could work. Yeah, and it's and it's, it's not like Kalorman culture here isn't present. It is very much present. It's just not direct. And, and Lewis is very critical of it in his writing and, and telling us how they're bad, but it's not connected to a, a, a real world culture that seems to then maybe potentially be attacking or at least stereotyping an, an entire people group. Right. But... Let's let's finish up this conversation, um, and let and let uh, Rabbit Ash head on his way. So what what happens here before he heads out? The Tisrog basically agrees to go along with the plan, but he also makes it clear that if this goes south or or north, <laughs> then that was an awful laugh. I apologize to all of our <laughs> listeners. That sounded like a fake laugh, but I really was laughing. It was a genuine one. We'll fix it in post. Do you want me to edit in instead of over like, there? I'll edit in. Like I've I'm been really... saying it for years. I think this show would be really good if we had a laugh track. All right. Um, I will have edited in. Everyone just heard me edit. Let's uh, have Conan O'Brien. I just put Conan O'Brien's laugh in there yeah. for everybody to hear. <laughs> oh, man. We are definitely not going to get the rights for that. He agrees. He agrees to the plan, but he also basically says, if this goes south, then I never knew you. I didn't know that you were going to do this, and I'm not going to come get you. Yeah, which is uh, kind of cold-blooded, say to your son, right? Like, hey, I'm not, uh, I-, I ain't coming for you, man. If you mess this up, you're gone. And, um, hold on. Yeah, and so then they, you know, Rabidash decides to head on out, and we get a what did you call this the uh, the post ample here mm-hmm. uh, between the vizier and um, oh, Siskin. So right before Rabidash leaves, there's one more thing I wanted to point out that is really, man, is it the word carbuncles? No, it's because not. Because that one threw me for a loop. No, tell me, did you have to look it up? I did. And this is the importance of reading all the definitions. So in context, he says, I have often heard that sons are in the eyes of their fathers more precious than carbuncles. Sure. The first definition for a carbuncle is a cluster of red boils on your skin. Not a great thing to be said about somebody. Right. Um, the other definition is more of a, a jewel. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think that is what's being said here. Uh, but right there in that, in that kind of same exchange, just a little bit further on, um, Rabidash, you know, kind of saying, hey, you know, I'm going to carry Prince Susan, or not Prince, uh, Queen Susan off with me. Man, the vizier makes a really, really wild line here that I think almost hits harder because we know that he wanted to marry Erevis. Which he says, uh, he says this, he says, therefore, if the prince by misfortune fell into their hands, they would assuredly not kill him. He's saying, hey, they're not going to kill Rabidash if he falls into their hands, the Narians. Mm-hmm. 
He says this, though, which is the really sick part. Nay, it may even be that though he failed to carry off the queen, yet the sight of his great valor and of the extremity of his passion might incline her heart to him. Oof. That is some perverted sense of love and marriage yeah. by the vizier here. Like, hey, you know what? Did he try to kidnap you and make you go home with him? Yeah. Did he fail? Yeah, but hey, he really likes you. You should be so just honored by how much he... I mean, that, that is such a twisted mindset. It, I think it's a result of you have a group that is entirely not heard or represented. Sure. And so there's nothing to contradict his thought process there. It's not that he's correct. It's that he's never heard He's otherwise. never heard any other woman be like, D what? Yeah. You're being idiotic here. And so he yeah. just assumes that he's right. Yeah. Oh, oh, I don't like these guys. This is fun. Yeah. Uh, well, so then Rabidash does leave, and that is when we're left with your the little uh, post-amble that you named here. Tell us about this conversation. The Tizrock explains to the vizier that his son was getting a little too difficult and threatening his power a little bit. And he's fine letting his son do this, even though he's his eldest, because it eliminates a problem. And then the next son in line probably won't be as much of a problem. Mm -hmm. And so it's to him in a weird twisted way, a win win either he gets the success of the battle and he gets all the credit or he gets rid of a problem. Yeah. And we see the family dynamics here really kind of put to bear, which is that the Tizarak doesn't really care about Rabidash. He is totally a pawn mm -hmm. in the Tizarak's plan. This is just like you said, Either way, this will work out well for the Tisserock. At least he thinks it will. Right. And so to him, he's like, yeah, do whatever. It, we, more than five Tisserocks, we learn, have died before their time because their eldest sons grew tired of waiting for their throne. So right. kind of like Sith, right? You know, the, yeah. the prince is supposed to rise up and like cut down the master and stuff. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of the same thing. I think this is where Lucas got it from. <laughs> One of my absolute favorite um, Star Wars memes that I've ever seen is a teacher walking Count Dooku through a math problem. Have you seen this one? No. Tell me some more about <laughs> it. I'll put it in. Uh, w yeah, go ahead and explain it. But if, if any listeners want to see it first before Phil says it, it's now in the episode description. Go look at it now, laugh at it, and then come back and hear Phil explain it. Right. Count Dooku is uh, talking to the teacher, and she's showing him his paper. And she goes, so you see how you knew that uh, there can only be two Sith at one time mm -hmm. and he's nodding along and she goes, and you help Palpatine train a new apprentice and he nods along. He goes, do you see how you eliminated yourself there? <laughs> <laughs> that is and funny. then the, the final panel is him just staring at it with a tilted head. <laughs> I just found it. This is great. Oh man. I love that. I love that. Um, well, that's, that's where the chapter ends, right? The, uh, all three of them eventually leave the room. The door closes behind them, and Erevis and Lazareline are left there alone in the same place that we left them. Right. They don't say anything, but they do finally breathe a sigh of relief because they can finally yes. make noise again. Man, I'm so excited for the next chapter and figuring out how these two girls are going to escape. They're in the midst of the palace. Like right. this isn't like they can just walk out the window and run away. I mean, yep. they're, they're going to have a hard time. I'll tell you what, having read it, I'm just really excited for this to be adapted because I think that there are quite a few elements that are very interesting. Here. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good time for me to share what my uh, prediction or theory is. Oh yes. For Daniel's dilemma. All right. So for, Here's what I think is is going to happen with this plan. Okay. I was thinking about where can I go with this. Let's, let's, we've talked a lot about this plan. Here's what I think happens. I do think that Rabidash is going to take. Uh, wait, what's the name of the city again? Um, Archenland. No, that's the that's the whole country. Oh, on Anvard. 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 Anvard yeah, yeah, sure. It's what you say when you're fencing. And uh, I don't think that's right. Um, maybe that's why you've lost all your fencing competitions. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, and Vard, that's right. And so um, I do think that Rabidash is going to, to capture Anvard. 
but I think that he doesn't make it to Narnia because I think that that Shasta and Erevis and Brehan and Hwen are going to intervene mm. before then, and that's how he meets back up with the with with Susan, Edmund, Lucy. Well, maybe he'll meet Lucy and Peter as well. Is that they will have kind of saved Narnia from this invasion mm. of. Uh, the Kalormans, and then they'll go back and they'll recapture Archland. I'm still convinced that uh, that Shasta and Prince Corin are long lost brothers, and mm. so that means that Shasta is in line for the throne. Oh. I think so. That's you know that's how I'm feeling about. This. So I think that's I think the plan works like half half of it works, and then Shasta and Erebus, through the help of Aslan, do not let Susan get captured. All right. That's kind of an easy one to go with because obvi- like I don't think they're obviously gonna like the Narnians are not gonna lose this battle, but that's that's where I'm going with this. Okay. Well, uh, Phil, next time we've got chapter nine, which is called Across the Desert. But before we go, we do have uh, some listener feedback, and I've actually got two for us today, and they're both uh, kind of similar, and I hope they'd be kind of fun. They're not related to Narnia today, uh, but the first one is a voicemail. So let's go ahead and listen to that voicemail right now. Okay. Hi, Phil and Daniel. This is Holly. I'm one of your longtime listeners, big fan of the show. Thank you so much for doing the podcast. So I just heard on your most recent episode that Daniel is in Enneagram 6. So I really want to know what Enneagram number is Phil. Thank you so much. See ya. Well, I can tell you. First of all, Holly, thank you for the voicemail. We love voicemails. And that was a really fun one. And I am a nine. <laughs> Anna, <it's holy. laughs> Anna just walked into the room. She heard the word Enneagram. Yep. She left the living room and has walked into us recording in the dining room. <laughs> she just... <laughs> she's like me if someone says Star Wars. <laughs> she just... I'm just going to mosey over there and see what they're talking about. Do you want to come about. sit down for a second? You want to say something? So for anyone that's that's interested, we did do an Enneagram episode last December over on the Dancing Lawn where we typed a bunch of Narnia characters and Anna and Sarah, Jane, were both with us because that's more of their their kind of thing than Phil and I's thing. But we, we talked a lot about the Enneagram and had a good time. And I, that's when I learned that I was a six. So mm. according to my wife and your wife and you kind of all agreed. As but, opposed to what we thought for a while, which was a seven. You guys thought, again, I'm not, I, I'm not very knowledgeable about the Enneagram. It's not really my thing. But you can also listen to the entire episode and you'll hear Daniel go through the, it's not really my thing, all the way to... I really like this a lot. There, there are no. There's some. I'm not anti enneagram or anything like that. It's just I personality types and stuff like that don't super. They're not super appealing to me, mm-hmm. which is why Anna said I was a seven for so long. She's nodding her head right now, <laughs> because she said that it, because I didn't want to be typed, and that's what made me a seven. Then she's uh-huh. like, No, I take it back. You, you, you like authority, and so that's what makes me a six. Is that right? Am I saying that right? Sure. She's saying sort of, but Phil, <laughs> I've talked too much about me. Tell us more about your enneagram number. I am a nine with a pretty strong one wing. And what is that for for people who are like, I have no idea what that means. Just tell us a little bit more. A nine is a peacekeeper who desire, that's the strongest desires for everything to, to kind of balance out and be for everyone to be at peace. And then the one is the perfectionist. And thanks Holly for the voicemail. Yeah. Holly, anytime anyone says Enneagram, that is just, my wife will just come into, <laughs> she just magically it. appears. It's like saying Beetlejuice three times. Wow. <laughs> you only have to say Enneagram once and Anna shows up out of nowhere. But yeah, Holly, thanks so much for that email. Yeah. That was really fun. Yeah. So Phil, you're a nine, but I, I will actually want to stay on the same topic. Uh, moving from Holly's, uh, voice and by the way, Holly, thank you also just for list- being a longtime listener of the show. It's kind of crazy that the show has been around for over three years now. We're five seasons in, and we have people that have listened for quite a bit of time. So just thank you for sticking with us. We appreciate that. Yeah, we do. On the uh, opposite end of that spectrum, though, are listeners who are new to the show. And this next email is from a listener who is actually new and has some questions that I thought would be kind of fun to answer here, Phil. Yeah. You want me to read this one? Go for it. This is from Lindsay, and she says, Hi, Dan and Phil. I'm a relatively new listener, and you can tell because she put your name first. <laughs> oh, she doesn't know that joke yet. That's yeah. fine. Don't, don't rag on her. She doesn't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I started with the silver chair, 
and binge listened to the whole season. I'm really enjoying The Horse and His Boy. I was wondering if you would mind telling the late joiners a little more about who you are and how you came to this project. So far, I've gathered that Dan is a teacher and Phil likes to rag on good music. Got him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for doing this great podcast. Well, I'm glad this is recorded because I don't remember what I said about good music. Um, Do you? you have gone on record not liking the new Taylor Swift records. You've also said uh, you don't really me. get the Beatles. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what else have you said. Those are the two ones that come to mind this past season. Yikes. I'm trying to think because she's because. Uh, Lindsay has said here she's only listened to seasons four and five so far. I don't remember what you said in any of the earlier seasons that she might not have gotten to yet. Okay. But I, the Beatles and Taylor Swift are the ones that you've kind of vocally been. And you have the, the Taylor Swift shirt, which is the X over all of her albums. I don't. I think that's a little much. I don't get yeah. it. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'll stop. The biggest problem is that Daniel will spin any little thing you say into a catastrophe and then you get a bunch of emails about it. Yeah. So Phil, um, I think this is actually kind of fun for new listeners. We talked earlier in the episode, did some kind of like, Hey, not Narnia related things Mm -hmm. at the very beginning here. Tell us a little bit more about yourself for any listeners that maybe just showed up in the last couple of uh, episodes or last season or two and have not listened from the very beginning, which we do know at this point, uh, quite a few of our listeners have kind of joined us later on and that's totally fine. You don't have to go back. I've said before that first season, uh, not great in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, well, it's better than the ones that we we deleted. Still better than away. those deleted yeah. episodes. Oof. But yeah, I I do think we're in. Uh, not that this is this is the best thing you've ever heard in your life, but I right. do think it has improved over the years. Right, and I love that there's a record of that where you can see the improvement. Um, but to answer the question, we are two people who really enjoy stories, and we enjoy talking about stories and how they're constructed. And we wanted to do a podcast where we went pretty methodically through some story. Mm -hmm. And we we came up with a few different things that we could have done. Daniel was a big fan of the Star Wars Minute, where they watch a Star Wars movie one minute at a time. Yep. And we thought, maybe we'll do something like that. And he went through a bunch of movies. And then we ended up, instead of doing the Narnia movie, we we realized that Narnia is seven books Mm -hmm. they're broken up into chapters we could do an episode about each chapter we also both really enjoy c.s lewis's work and i think that we connected on the fact that we have a lot of kind of pop culture interest and knowledge and then it was odd for me because i thought that i was really good at this stuff but then i got to know daniel and saw that he had like 10 times that amount of information <laughs> to pull from and c- could do things like name exactly which office episode something's in. I mean, technically I was off by one, but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but even, even to get that close. And I think that we, um, we just wanted to work on something where we had this set scheduled time as life got busier and we wanted to make mm-hmm. content. We didn't want to just consume the content. We wanted to talk about it in a way that maybe we could like share our thoughts with other people and it really, we were going to be happy just doing this, the two of us, and then putting it out there and seeing what happened. And it ended up being a little bigger than we expected, which is a really pleasant <laughs> surprise. Yeah. I mean, it was never something where we were like... And you we're know, talking I, to you from our yacht. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the Patreon's going wild these days. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it never was something that we were super concerned about getting a ton of listeners and stuff. It was obviously, we love that. Like, don't get me wrong. We love hearing from our listeners. That's why we've, we eventually made listener feedback be a, a, an important part of every single episode because we wanted there to be this kind of, you know, element of community. Obviously it's a weird kind of community because uh, we choose, uh, we don't, we can't read everybody's stuff that comes in. So, you know, we're responding to, to people. And it's not like they're necessarily guests on the show, but we did want to really build it up. But yeah, like you said, we never really thought that we'd have thousands of listeners, and I think I think recently we're in a hundred countries. We have listeners in a hundred countries. That's mm-hmm. that's nuts to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just we wanted to talk about something. You know, it was when that's why we really started out as Narnia novices because it wasn't we. Like, I had read some of the books as an adult. You had read none of them as an adult, and we were looking like, hey, where is there kind of a a, a gap? And something that we both would be interested. Mm-hmm. 
and, and going through together. And at the time, there wasn't anyone reading the Narnia books one chapter at a time, and that was kind of the thing. No, there's other podcasts that do that now. That's great. I mean, yeah. we're not like these competitive guys who are like, yeah, this is our space, get out. No, 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 no. We like literally welcome that. I think it's great that there's other yeah. people doing that. It's it's podcasting. They're not, no, nobody, there's unlimited space available for everyone, and I think that's wonderful that there's more people doing. There's some people that I think read it like chronologically. So they started with Magician's Nephew. Mm -hmm. and um, but, but it very much was like at that time, there was, if you searched Narnia on you know Apple Podcasts or something, you found Pints with Jack, which David and Matt had just started out and they were obviously doing Mere Christianity at the time. And then there was our, our friends over at um, Talking Beast and you had... You had Brian and, and that kind of crew over there, but they, they do kind of a, a little bit different thing. And so we thought, hey, this is a great place for us to kind of jump in and talk about something that we're interested in talking about. And it's turned in, obviously now, I think you and I both love C.S. Lewis so much more. Like, it's funny, I went from this guy who just had read some of the Narnia books as an adult and enjoyed reading you know, some of them with my students, to being like, I feel like most places I go, people are like, oh, that's the C.S. Lewis guy. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm legitimately not, though, like, because I know all these other people we've interviewed or talked to. I'm like, no, those people are C.S. Lewis guys. You and I are just, we're like a step above novices. Yep. We know a little bit more. We know who Walter Hooper is. We've been able to talk to some really great um of scholars along the way and got the you know we got to meet douglas gresham that's still gonna always come up that was so cool yeah. but we're still not like we're not geniuses on this stuff we're just two guys we're literally hanging out in my dining room just having a good time my wife comes next in next to a giant pile of cash giant <laughs> <laughs> giant pile of cash um the dining room table that we record at was my grandparents 50 years ago if that tells you anything about oh. Uh, how much money this thing is making us. <laughs> that explains why my hip hurts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but okay, so that's a little bit about the show though, Phil. But but um, Lindsay also asked a little bit more about us. So could you tell us a little bit more about you? Sure. Outside of this, I'm on a big science fiction kick and I'm really enjoying books like that. I also have an illustration background. I really enjoy making comics. Mm -hmm. And you have you got your bachelor's in illustration. That's right. Yeah. That's a pretty big deal. That's really cool. Yeah. And I it was something that I was really serious about for a long time. And I still am serious about the craft. It's just not as much a focus for yeah. career stuff when you can make as much as we do podcasting. You don't have <laughs> as much time for drawing. And, and remind I'm, me the name of the, the stuff you illustrate. It's that, um, Gar Garfield. Is that, is that how you pronounce yeah, the, it? It's said different in different countries, but yeah, it's mostly <laughs> drawing John and his girlfriend and a cat. And a, yeah. Phil is not your real name. It actually is Jim Davis. Right, and, yeah. uh, I don't like to share that with too many people. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, in addition to that... Yeah, what I, do you do for a living? In for a living, I program computers. What is what, for, for people like me, mm -hmm. who are not computer guys, What tell us just a, a, just a little bit more. Um, we're, I do some of the stuff that makes everything work in the background of a site. So I don't design what the site looks like, and I don't design what the buttons look like. And I really don't even design the, I don't even make the part that when you click it, it goes to a link, but then I do everything that's in the background. So it, it runs all these calculations or it figures out where the information that you want is, mm -hmm. or it changes the state of something. And we specifically work with medical companies that are trying to get new drugs out there. Oh, cool. Yeah. I don't think I knew that last part. I knew all the other stuff, obviously. I don't think I knew it was yeah. like medical companies and stuff. Yeah, a lot of it is software for clinical trials. You also, uh, you just got married about nine months ago. I did. I, uh, I really. To one of our first guests on the show. To one of our first, the first guest. The first guest. Sarah Jean, show. you guys were not dating at the time. I, Anna and I were really pushing it. Anna and I, Anna and Sarah Jane went to college together at UNC Chapel Hill. And you guys kind of knew each other through us and through a bunch of other people, not just us. But we were like, we, we had really, met a few times before, but we really wanted to set y'all up. And then we made it happen. And I'm very we made it happen by making us watch the extended version of the Lord of the Rings. Very slowly over the right. course of a year. That's right. Hey, it worked. Uh, and it then really after did. that, then we had a car ride together. And where did we? Then we had another car ride together. Where did we drive to? Um, back and forth from home to here. Home? Oh, North Carolina. Oh, yeah. sorry. I was like home. Like we're literally in my home. We yeah. did. We did Christmas in uh, in uh, in the Triangle. That's right. Um, and that was really fun. I forgot we did that. That was yeah. So you know we're coming up on your one year anniversary. That's kind of exciting. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, how about you? You've been married for 15? I've been married for six years. years. No, no, no. no. I've been married for six years. I, uh, like Lindsay said, I am a teacher. That's right. I've uh, been in education now for, I've been in a school for eight, going on eight years now. Well, you've been in a school for... 20, uh, that's true. I've been in school since I was in kindergarten or preschool. Actually, I started at like three. Yeah. Um, but uh, but been been being paid to be at that school for eight years. I teach uh, currently. I teach um, middle school humanities. So I, I teach ancient and medieval history and literature as well as composition. I uh, at a classical Christian school, independent school, um, and I love it. I love what I do. I love what I get to teach. I love learning and I love kids. I love working with kids and just seeing just in how incredibly uh, smart and hardworking and just able to conquer so many things. I mm-hmm. just love that in kids. Um, but I'm also, I'm in grad school. I'm getting my degree in educational leadership. I've already spent a year um, as an administrator before, and so I'm hoping to continue to go into that into the future. So uh, hoping to, to switch over to the administrative side of things in the, the kind of coming years here. Mainly uh, for the walkie-talkie? Yeah, you know, I really wanted the walkie-talkie. That's my yeah. actually. I so when I was an admin, I I did not like the walkie-talkie. Yeah. It's so he- like, how is it that here? I'm, I just picked up my phone. I can fit five thousand songs, probably mm-hmm. ten thousand songs, on this thing, plus like five thousand pictures, podcast episodes, movies, and yet somehow. The technology for a walkie-talkie has remained the same size for twenty-five years. Yeah, that makes no sense. I hated. I hate wearing a walkie-talkie. I really don't like it. I feel like it's way too heavy. It just. It, it's awkward. You know. I don't. It just. It's weird. Why is it not like? Uh, why isn't it smaller? It should be a watch at this point. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. But. Uh, but no, I'm they not going into administ- I'm not going into administration for the walkie-talkie. Um, but yeah, so I think, I, you know, that's, that's a little bit more about me. Uh, Anna and I have a little boy who is, uh, just a little over a year old at this point. And Jack, he Jack. is, he, is, <laughs> no, uh, he is full of energy and life. And he also really, really loves stories and the greatest pleasure and joy I have in life is being that kid's dad. So mm. it's super, super fun. And it's kind of cool that like, you know, we started the podcast and you weren't, married and I didn't have any kids or I didn't have a kid and now here we are. So hopefully that answers a little bit more about us. I think is there anything else we should we should share? I think that's pretty good right there. Phil, let me let me do this. Okay, boom. Top three T V shows. Just just name them just name a couple. Let me not top three. Just three T V shows you really like. I really enjoyed The Office. Um I really enjoyed Community too. Mm-hmm. And this was also on Thursday night for a while, Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec, booms, yeah. NBC sitcoms the, of the, the classics. And late two thousands. I don't watch a ton of stuff now. I am interested in some of the new stuff. Um, oh, you're one of those readers, the, I guess. <laughs> no, I'm trying. I'm a recovering uh, addict to shows. Sure. And I have to be very careful because they are really good at making those shows now. And fair enough, yeah. You got a, a as you get older, you realize how little time you have, and then you you pick your pick your stuff. Yeah, I was I was recently editing. I think it's the same episode where we talked about the enneagrams. I was recently editing. Maybe it was a different one, but um, where I got on. No, no, no. It's episode. It was episode five. It was chapter five of Horse and His Boy, where I got on my soapbox about um, spoilers and how kind of I really didn't like the the modern television market and the mm-hmm. way that just like everything is supposed to be this like digestible story. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you know, we watch we watch a season of Netflix when it comes out. You're supposed to watch it over a weekend to talk about it, and then you like never return to it, right? Whereas like there's episodes of The Office or Community or Cheers, you know, back, like still talking about. Well, you still you know yeah. go back to it. It's it, it's not just meant to be. It's it's not content that's only meant to be consumed, which is kind of where we've we've kind of come to recently. But what I didn't mention in that is I kind of got on my soapbox and and hopefully didn't come across as this like better than thou kind of thing. Is it like, it is really hard. It's easy to say that, but it's hard because like there are legitimate good TV shows too. Like I try, I'm more of a movie guy myself, but I, I, you know, I have people going like, you got to watch this show. It's so good. It was such a great story. And I do love good stories. Yeah, I really do. And there are good ones out there. We, Anna and I this summer, you know, we, we, we don't watch a ton, a ton of TV, 
uh, as much anymore just because of the kid and work and grad school. But over the course of the summer, we watched, um, oh, what's it called? Broad Church mm-hmm. uh, by, uh, you know, over, I think it probably be BBC Tennant. or something. Yeah, David Tennant, Olivia Coleman. And I tell you, some of so it's, it's very short series, like 24 episodes, and it took us a month or two to get through it. But man, some of the storytelling there was just outstanding. It was, and I'm, I really don't like crime stuff, but some of the most humanizing kind of crime, probably the most humanizing crime show I've ever seen, where like everything mm-hmm. was treated not as like, oh my gosh, look at this terrible thing that happened. Like, let's like, it's ooh and odd. It was like, no, like these are real people. These are real consequences, and this is nothing to be celebrated or enjoyed. It's something to mm-hmm. grieve and lament over. And I thought it was really beautifully done, but I put it off for a long time because I'm like, I don't have time for a new show. I don't want, you know, I don't, I don't want to watch that. I've just, you know, it's just me and my Star Trek. That's all I want. That's yeah. all I want. And, uh, but man, really well done. I'm like, that's what am I else am I missing out on? I've thought it really like it grew me as a person to kind of engage with uh, this and Anna High, some really good conversations on you know car rides over vacations in the summer, talking about kind of what we had seen and experience. And so like, I, I, I I hope I don't come across as like, oh, I hate TV or I hate, you know, screens or something like that because they really can bring something really great and something that grows us as people. I just think they also can be, you know, they can become dangerous. Just, right. For sure. I got to get off the soapbox. I feel like I've jumped on it so much this season already. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It's, uh, it's that darn TikTok these days. Oh, gosh. <laughs> My, uh, I'm gonna, I, he listened to this. I'm going to say it. My dad texted me earlier today. And uh, I was was telling me like, hey, have you seen this thing called TikTok? T I C space T O C. <laughs> have you seen this thing called TikTok? I it is, I'm reading it now. I don't know how to forward tweets <laughs> from TikTok, so but I've seen a, a good one. Places. <laughs> That's the text. <laughs> I don't know how to forward tweets. From TikTok, T I C T O C, but I've seen a good one. Yep, I love my dad so much. He's the best. Have you seen that video? Probably on listening now, <laughs> and uh, but I just was like dad. He's and he's a, he's a he's a sharp guy. Any any kind of intelligence that I have, which isn't a lot, but any that I do have is from both of my parents. I've, well, obviously, where else would it be from? <laughs> but like, my my parents are both very very sharp people, yep. and. Uh, and, but you saw a tweet from TikTok. <laughs> and to be fair, we grew up, we grew up as apps were kind of introduced, and mm-hmm. man, things got really strange really fast. Yeah, recently. So, well, I think that's okay, a little bit uh, fun things kind of about us here. Yeah. Um, if anyone else is interested in listening more to this, uh, we are doing. We did already do. I should say. Uh, back in August, we did uh, our third kind of annual episode of Q and A's mm-hmm. over at the Dancing Lawn. Where First we go eight th- questions. All right, Phil. Well, I think that is the uh, end of our episode here. A lot of uh, non Narnia talk here at the end, but, uh, but every time we do it, though, people say they really enjoy it. So um, yeah. I think this will be the last Narnia focused episode we have, right? And just switch over to our our new talk show. Come on back to Daniel and Phil in the morning. <laughs> Daniel you see that guy hit that moose? Well, it doesn't. It doesn't work with our uh, the syllables in our names. Phil and Daniel in the morning. Oh yeah, you just have to switch it. Nice. I was just trying to do Daniel and Phil. Yeah, and uh, it'll get you every time, man. Yeah, Phil My and name Daniel sounds better for us. Actually, does work. All right, well, why don't you go ahead and wrap up this episode, man? Will do. This episode is made possible by our patrons over at Patreon.com. If you'd like to support the show, you too can listen to a bonus episode each month, along with other rewards. Special thanks goes to Elias Dean, Hannah Anderson, John Marr, Emily Wakefield, and Ryan Smith for supporting us at our top tiers. Listener feedback can be sent to thenarniapodcast at gmail.com or if you want to leave a voicemail, 406-646-6733. A review on Apple Podcasts would also be appreciated. Thank you for coming along on this journey, and we will be back next time with Chapter 9.